I'm going to read these off. How can I use peak force as a load determinant without sacrificing velocity quality? So basically, how can I uh, force train a kangaroo without slowing them down? So we had Keegan, he's an 18-year-old baseball player, training age of three, um, four months of off-season training. So our first two blocks were force training with him. Our goal was to increase concentric force output uh, without, you know, progressively increasing the load without uh, sacrificing his peak velocity. Um, his, his peak force was produced at 0.48 meters per second at 270 pounds. Uh, his force dipped below 0.48. And you can see the, the programming set up, two four-week blocks of force training. Uh, we use the chains method here, and uh, we squatted. Here's one thing that I'm not afraid to, you know, like a lot of people, I've, I've had conversations with them, say, what do you do this one time a week? I'm not afraid to go hard twice a week in this squat, lower body squat, because there's only one type of squat, not lower body squat, but... Um, <laughs> in a lower body movement because uh, of the auto-regulation component that velocity-based training offers. Um, they're walking in, because their readiness is already taken into account, their fatigue is taken into account, I, I'm, I'm not that concerned about pushing them into an overtrained state and burying them. Uh, and so Keegan trained on Monday and Friday with his lower body. Here are his sets and reps. Um, I probably started him too high in his velocity. Um, I would have probably started somewhere, if I had to do this over again, maybe here and then gone down. Again, his peak force was produced at 0.48. So if we're using peak force as their one rep max or their, you know, their relative one rep max or their training one rep max, um, I probably would have started not at such a high velocity. I would have gone lower. And so if I had to do this over again. Accessory work was done. He's a baseball player, so we did your typical medicine ball work. Uh, he was working on his deadlift patterning. patterning. He, just, we, he wasn't very good at it, so uh, while we were training the squat, he was uh, patterning a deadlift. Uh, once a week, he did six 15-yard sprints just to maintain his velocity, uh, just to kind of give a little bit of input with that still. And um, he did lower volumes of low-intensity plyometrics, again, just for kind of maintenance of that elasticity. Here's the results. So these results are skewed uh, because... I didn't take him further than 300 pounds in his load velocity profile to actually see what his peak force could be. Um, he had a good amount more in the tank, and I stopped him at 300 because he had never done 300 before. And so he was a little bit nervous. So we did 300. Uh, it came up at 0.41. Uh, visibly, he probably could have done up a little bit more and gotten a little bit higher peak force. But here's the cool thing. We gradually increased his load, we increased his peak force he could produce, and his peak velocity went up. His power output and his counter movement jump went up. He gained three inches on his standing vert, uh, three and a half on his vertical with an approach, and his sprint, his 10 yard sprint time stayed pretty much the same. It was uh, 155 to 156. So moral of this story, Using the velocity at which their peak force is produced as a load determinant uh, doesn't, remember we, we talked about that training window, it doesn't pull their training window uh, uh, you know, one way or the other, so you maintain or raise your velocity qualities because you're increasing force production. So you kind of spread out your window versus pulling it and possibly losing some speed qualities there. Does that make sense? And we did that right while we've been talking about today.